bear with me one second. I'm just going to restart some audio things and then we should be good. Okay, let me see if that fixed a few things. I'm just going to wait for. Okay, let me see if that yes, it did. Good. Sorry about that. Just required um, <laughs> a little restart of the audio device. Uh, so hopefully uh, we are all good now. Just let me know if that drops out again, but should be all right. Okay, so what was I saying? So those of you on Facebook, uh, if you wish to answer a question, just put that in the comments and then uh, myself or Diego will pick that up. If you're in the webinar room, then try to keep your questions to the little Q&A tab. And then that way, uh, it just keeps it set from, from the chat and it's easier to follow what's going on. If you wanna hide the chat, that's at this point where we were, uh, you can do so by clicking that small arrow and then you'll get a bit more space uh, for Capture One. Of course, that doesn't apply uh, to you looking on Facebook. All right, so what are we going to do today? So we're gonna cover a couple of workflow things. So before we get to editing some of these shots over here, we're just gonna look at a couple of useful things I feel for the import process. Uh, we'll look a little bit of selection, culling and rating and so on. Uh, not in any massive amount of detail. Uh, if you want to dig deeper, then I suggest if you look on our YouTube channel or Learning Hub, look for any sessions on catalogs or sessions, and then there tends to be a little bit more on that. But this is just going to be a taster. And then we look at some editing, how we can tackle um, not the best time of day, not the best lighting, or a few other kind of errors that might pop up when you're just looking to capture that moment as opposed to hang around at four o'clock in the morning waiting for the sun to come up. So that's the idea. And then we look at a couple of different export things which you might find useful as well. Okay, so now uh, before we get to editing, as I said, uh, we've got the little mouse locator which we might use from time to time. So we're gonna close this catalog for now. We're gonna open that in a second and we're just gonna make ourselves a brand new Capture One catalog. Let's just call this webinar PM. So we've got a nice empty start point and we're gonna import some photos. Hope I've picked up the right memory card from this uh, memory card here, not a ton but just to show you a couple of tips you might find useful for importing. So let's put that memory card in the reader and hopefully that should pop up as it does. Uh, so I've just deleted most of what's on this memory card because you didn't want to see 500 pictures of, uh, of uh, animals getting imported. So we've got 36 shots here and what I want to do is just show you a couple of tips uh, for naming and import and so on. If the import window doesn't pop up, don't forget just hiding behind the import window is the import button. So you can always hit that and then choose uh, the location where you want to import your pictures from. So first thing that we're gonna do is decide where we wanna set these pictures. Now, currently it's set to add to catalog, which we don't wanna do because uh, your files are gonna stay where they are. We wanna get them off the memory card to a safe spot on your computer system. So let's copy them into a folder. So I'm gonna make a, a folder in my pictures called my photo library. And that's really gonna be the default of where all my pictures are gonna go from now forever, hypothetically speaking. So that's if you like the master top level folder, which could be on your hard drive, could be on an external disk, doesn't matter. So we're gonna set that as the import folder. Now this setting here is gonna be constant for every import that you do in the future. And all we need to do is change the subfolder where we want to put particular pictures in the future. So I'm gonna divide this up by first of all, uh, putting a location. So this was the wildlife park, as you might guess. And by adding a forward slash, so a little tiny forward slash you can see there on your keyboard, we're gonna ask Capture One to make a further uh, subfolder. 
And in this case, we can either manually create our subfolder or we can ask Capture One to do it dynamically. Now, generally, if we can do it dynamically by using a token, then it saves us time. So what we're going to do is add the token called image date and drag that up there. So Capture One's going to make me a folder called Wildlife Park and then make a further folder underneath with the image, or sorry, with the date that the image was captured. And I'm going to change the format of the date by selecting it here. So it's going to be year, month, date. So the next time I come to import, I'm not going to touch this. I'm just going to change my subfolder arrangement. Now, this is just one suggestion. You can bake this however you like, but this is how I personally organize my imports. So I'm going to say OK, like so. So Capture One will look at the metadata and then divide them up into different date folders if applicable. These, as you can probably guess, were all shot on the same date. So we're gonna end up with one folder. Next thing, naming. So again, we can use tokens in Capture One to make us, uh, hopefully, a naming convention that is always gonna be unique and never gonna be repeated. Now for convenience or speed, you might think, well, let's just leave it uh, for the file name of the camera. It's not the best solution, mostly because it doesn't, first of all, make the file name unique. There is a danger if you're a super prolific photographer that the counter will tick over and you'll end up having pictures with the same file name, which is not great for your catalog. Uh, I had this situation where I was shooting with a Sony a7, which is just over my shoulder, just out of shot, and this camera, which is a Sony RX100, and of course, both being Sony's, they both followed the same naming convention. And I actually had a collision when I didn't bother being lazy uh, to come up with my own naming convention. So let's fix that by first of all using a few different tokens. So the first one we're going to grab is job name. More on that in a second. Then we're going to use the image date token once more. And we change that to year, month, day. And so we don't end up with 36 pictures all with the same name, we need to add some variable, which is a counter. Now, by default, the counter is one digit, which is kind of stupid because that would only give us nine pictures. So we're gonna change this to four digits. Now, if you're trigger happy and you don't think four is enough, then of course you can bump it up to something a bit bigger. And to make this a bit neater, we're gonna put a little dash in between each of these tokens, like so. So what does the job name token mean? Well, let's just choose a picture for a second. So we've got untitled job, the date of which this was captured, 9th of August, 2021, and untitled job. So I'm gonna put in here YWP, Y for Yorkshire Wildlife Park, which is where these were taken. So now we've got a nice unique naming convention, which I hope would never be repeated again. Now the next import that you do, let's say five weeks time, you do something else. All these settings in the import window are sticky. So all I'm gonna to have to change on my next import is what's written in job name. So if we went to London, for example, I could just pop this in here like so. Everything else is dynamic, which is great. Uh, so let's put that back to YWP. Note that the counter starts at one. If you need to reset it, you've got counter at options in here. So this will reset um, my counter again. Okay, so let's um, open that up. I'm just checking that you guys, did we lose sound again? No, I think we're okay. I'm just a bit paranoid now that, no, we still got sound. Sorry, just give me a wave if uh, there is no sound again. Okay, so where was I? So I'm gonna put this back to Yorkshire Wildlife Park, uh, and then we can reset the import counter if we wish, or set it to a particular number. Okay, always add your copyright, why not? Uh, it is Alt-G or Option-G on the Mac to get the copyright symbol, uh, and then we can go David Grover, like so. I Again, I can't remember what it is on the PC, I badly forgot to look it up. Someone on a PC reminded us this morning. So if you're in the chat and then you know what the copyright symbol is on the PC, please let us know. So that's a relatively easy setup, which is repetitive, um, consistent and repeatable. 
So that might seem a lot to set up, but really the next time you've just got to change this and where you want the pictures to go in the subfile arrangement, everything else is constant. Now, if you don't want to import everything, then you might not have spotted this little viewer icon at the top, which was a fairly recent addition to Capture One. But if we turn that on, this allows us to see a slightly bigger view of each of the pictures where you can make a better decision whether you want to import everything or not. By default, if you look just down here, kind of next to me, by default, everything is chosen to be imported. Now, generally what I do is that I just tend to dump everything off the card. But if you've shot you know, a bunch of pictures and you know there's gonna be um, a lot of misses or out of focus shots or, or whatever, then it's not necessarily very efficient to import everything. So now with the import viewer, we can make some much better choices about which ones we wanna keep. Now, all you need to do, if we bring up the overhead camera for a second, you can see the cursor keys here. So I know I'm covering the picture at the moment, but it's basically left and right cursor key to move through and space bar. So if you just look at the picture just below my, my hand here, when we hit the space bar, we can toggle the decision on and off whether to import that picture. So it's very easy to move through quickly and decide what we don't want. Now for these shots, I'm just gonna import most of these, but if we know there's like a particular dud like this one, I'm not gonna use that then that just saves me importing that picture. So very quickly I can go through and almost immediately decide if there's any that I don't want. Probably that one, not really worth it. That one we took out already. And we're using the preview data on the memory card so it's really, really quick. So just don't forget you've got that option. So now we are gonna say import 34 images. So that's just below me down there, just hiding me and then that's gonna start importing. Now, a really important um, fact here. The import process is a background task. So don't sit here and wait for this to finish. You, there's nothing to stop you scrolling through what's already been imported, having a look, doing some rating or whatever, uh, zooming in, check for focus, and immediately start editing if you want to. So this is a background task. So even if I pick something down here, Capture One will prioritize building the preview for it. You know, it's pretty seamless that, you know, I can just go through. See, Capture One prioritized making me this preview instead of the, the whatever the one that was just being made. So don't forget um, that you can do so. So let's just move the activity window off for a second. So what does our import look like? So if we look in the finder for one moment, so on the other monitor, over we come, we've got my photo library, wildlife park, and then the date they were shot like so. And if you look at the naming convention, we've got YWP, the date they were shot, and uh, a counter as well. Now, of course, they don't relate to the file name that was shot on the memory card. For me, I don't really care about that because once they're imported, backed up, then that memory card is formatted and the name of it is kind of irrelevant moving on from that point. But this way we've got our nice unique uh, naming convention. How does that look in the folders tool? Let's just hide the filters. We can see obviously the same folder structure like so. So now of course, when we just wanna go through and um, do another import, if we just click on the import window, just remember, change this thing here and our naming convention which closed and then you're good to go. So that will give you a nice, clean, consistent naming. Right, let's just um, check if we've got any questions. Now I think Diego is all pretty good answering everything. Um, no, we're all good, apart from people saying, you're on mute. So <laughs> we should all be good now. <laughs> okay, um, next thing, culling and rating. Just have a quick drink. There's lots of different ways that you can decide which are the pictures that you want to, to pick out of a collection like this. I've never met two people who do it in the same way. So this is just my suggestion. 
Uh, I don't think you have to get too involved in it or come up with, come up with you know, really complex workflows. Really all you're doing is deciding which pictures are the best by giving them some kind of tag or a mark. So the first thing that I do personally is, well, before we get to that, is make sure if you've got a numerical keypad, sorry, I know it's a little bit glary, is actually set up these numerical keys in a useful way for culling and rating. So if we go to our edit keyboard shortcuts tool, like so, and then if we look in adjustments and color tag, like so, we can see that maybe it looks a bit curious if we bring up rating this is super obvious of course zero to five on the numerical keypad zero one two three four five star rating simple why do i have six nine eight seven for color tags well if we look at the numerical keypad this is seven eight and nine so seven for green eight for yellow nine for red six just clears the color tag so that's how you know, we set that up. By default, it's actually plus, minus, and star. So plus is green, minus is red, star is yellow. But if you don't have a numerical keypad that's kind of sitting above these numerical keys, which isn't really super easy to use. So if you do have this pad, that's a, a nicer way to set it up, I would say. So with that in mind, let's close this down. Let's hide the keypad view for a second. And then let's look at select next when. Just if you don't, if you're not aware of this feature, um, it's very, very useful when you're going through this process. So what this simply means is when I star rate or color tag a picture, capture one will automatically advance to the next. So my first step of looking through a bunch of pictures is really deciding if they're in or out, good or bad. And by saying something is good, I'll just mark it green by tapping seven on my keyboard. And note, if you look above my head, we've already advanced to the next shot. So, you know, I would just go through and then keep tapping the green key when I know something's good. If I just hide me for a second. So you can see on the right hand side, capture one is automatically advancing. If I just need to step back for whatever reason, it's only a thumbs reach to go backwards and forwards using the cursor keys like so. So it's a nice leisurely way to, to uh, edit. So I could just go through, look at the picture, tap the key when I need it. You know, if I come across anything dud that I didn't you know, get rid of in that import phase, then of course it's very simple just to hit the number nine on my keyboard, which is the red one, and then that's marked and so on. So that's really my step one. So I'm just going to add a few more. Let's just throw a few reds in there. <laughs> red, uh, speaking of, red panda, if you want to know what the animal is. Um, and away we go. So that's really my step one. Now what we can of course do then is go over to our filters tool, which I collapsed earlier, and say show me the greens. So now I'm looking at really all the pictures that I feel at some point might be worthy of some editing attention. Now I have a few duplicates here and so on, but what my personal next step is, is that anything that I feel that I want to start editing straight away, like I feel, you know, this out of all of them, which one is the one I think I'm gonna divert my attention to? Luckily this guy was super photogenic. So let's go for whatever this one as there's a bit of action so all i would do then if i just hide my head for a second i would tap five on the keyboard and then i'd have that marked as five stars as you can see over here like so so any other shot that i feel that i think i could do something nice with straight away i'll tap five on my keyboard notice how it auto advances and then keep going through until i tagged a few of those with a five star so let's grab that one as well now it's really super simple over on the far side of capture one we've got three that have been five star tagged and away we go so now these are the three that i want to start editing straight away fairly simple workflow as i said no two people really do it the same but that's the one that i've settled on I personally don't have the patience to rate something as a five, a three, or a one. 
you know, I'm very impatient looking at pictures. So really it's a case of, is it terrible or is it acceptable? And then it's a case of prioritizing what I'm gonna edit once I've got a few minutes to spare. So really that's my process. Um, let's have a look. Um, Bjorn was asking, does the number increase even if you select a different naming? Yeah, so the next time that you go in, uh, if we are on um, the same session, you see notice that the counter or the same catalog, notice that the counter is now gonna start at 35. So just keep an eye on your counter. So if you want it to reset to one, we just go in here and say reset import counter, like so. Um, that's all you really need to be aware of. You can shortcut key that as well. So I just know before I hit import, let's just reset the counter if I wish. Uh, what keyboard am I using? <laughs> Interesting question. So this is a Logitech uh, MX Keys. Is it better than the Apple keyboard? Sorry, Apple, but I personally prefer it to the Apple keyboard. Uh, the reason is just there's a bit, bit more um, depth on the inputs. But the Apple keyboard is lovely as well. There's one just sitting under the desk here. I find for my typing style, I can just type a bit faster than this. But the Apple keyboard is a really nicely made, beautifully engineered keyboard. Certainly connectivity is a bit more reliable. This one does drop out once in a while on a restart, but otherwise it works super nicely. Okay, uh, Pierre says, can I repeat the select adjustment please? So this was this one, select next when. So basically when you add a star rating or a color tag, capture one will automatically select the next picture. It saves you a mouse click or a cursor button click every time you select, uh, rate a picture. Um, let's just have a check on the questions over here. Um, Mike was asking, in Lightroom, it was a more efficient use of memory to import half while it was just digesting those, import the other half. I would say definitely not. If you need to import a thousand pictures, import a thousand pictures. That's really the best way to do it. I wouldn't complicate the workflow by trying to divide it up into two different things. So we've had a look at that. Um, now we can move on to editing. Finally, you hear, hear, <laughs> I cry, hear you cry, but hopefully those little tips were useful as well. So let's open up this catalog and see where we go. Incidentally, if you wanna see a bit of wildlife editing and that little red panda guy, uh, then stop back here on Tuesday at the same time. And then we're gonna go through some wildlife edits. So hold that thought. Okay, I thought I'd start with this picture purely because there's lots of different ways you can edit this shot. It's the kind of picture you might come away with on, on a trip. It's the kind of picture you might shoot quickly because you want to catch the moment before the dog buggers off and does something else uh, where you're less concerned about having the best camera settings, being on a tripod, being as straight as possible. So this has loads of different potential for editing also because of its dynamic range. So let's just reset that because I can see a few settings on it. So that's how it comes out of camera. First obvious thing that we need to fix with this is it's not straight. So we can grab our straighten tool at the top here and then draw along the horizon line and then capture one will rotate about that point. So now we've straightened that. Next, we're gonna grab our crop tool and do a crop which is a little bit more interesting, like so. Incidentally, when you're cropping, shortcut, if you right click, you can bring up your various different ratios, which you've got set here, crop to an output, which we're gonna look at at the end, or create your own aspect ratios as well. Also, if you don't like that grid popping up, then you can toggle that off as well, but let's go for that. Okay, so now we've got our favored crop if you like now we can think about editing two things that are really obvious about this shot or i hope they're obvious is one it's too dark secondly as this was shot at 20 past six as we can see color balance is probably not quite right i would expect this to be a bit warmer the sand to look a bit more golden uh, the dog's coat to look a bit warmer as well so that's kind of off the camera's overcompensated for sunset and neutralized it too far. 
But first of all, let's deal with um, the exposure side of things. So instantly, you might run to the exposure slider and bump that up first of all. Let's do that, and then we're gonna edit it a different way. So if I bring up the exposure, we're gonna to get to something like that, where the dog now looks much more visible, but we've lost a lot of the detail and what's going on in the background. And before messing around too much, let's just warm it up a touch as well to something like that. So that looks instantly a bit more believable with the golden sand color and a bit more warmth in the back and so on. Now as at its go, you might be pretty happy with that. The dog stands out nicely from the background and so on. However, we have lost a lot of the detail that's going on in the background, but that could be sort, thought of as a bit of a high key edit. So let's do the opposite and then pull down our highlights and then gradually we can get a bit of you know, data going back in the background like so. So the exposure pushed it one way, and then of course the highlight slider brought that back the other way. Not too bad at all, actually looks pretty good. It's a bit on the flat side, so personally I would throw in a little bit of clarity as well, like so. Do we need to do anything else? probably not bad if we just have a quick look at the levels hit auto and then that will just make sure we don't have any flatness to the image and now the contrast is improved a little bit as well looks much much better so if we turn on before and after then you can see before and after like so so we didn't do a lot to that shot but now we are significantly better than it came out of camera so let's make another we're gonna make a clone of that, so it's the same crop and everything. And I'm gonna reset what we did with exposure, and we're gonna reset what we did with high dynamic range and clarity, did we do anything else? And we keep everything else pretty much the same. So instead of bumping up exposure, because if I was, if this was the first time I saw this shot, I wouldn't have gone down the exposure route. I would have jumped straight to brightness because I would know that We've got all this highlight detail in the background here. I wanna try and keep as much of that as possible. So I would simply bring up the brightness, which is gonna have more of an effect on our mid-tones. So if we slowly bump this up to the dog is looking about right, and now we've got you know maybe a better balance compared to the background because we haven't blown out the brightness quite so much. Um, but do we need to lift up the shadows a bit on the dog? Probably ever so slightly. So if we just open up the shadows slightly, that's pretty much focused just on this area. Maybe that's a bit unnatural. So we've almost ended up with the same result. I say that, but have we? Let's have a look. So that was with our exposure and the highlights back. That was with our brightness only and no highlight adjustment. So if we pull the highlights back on this one, probably something around there then we're not a million miles off. But two different approaches, rarely, relatively similar end result. Is one better than the other? No, but it's just nice to know that the difference between brightness and exposure in this case. There's so much dynamic range in a shot with a modern camera like this. It's just really which bits of the elastic band do you want to stretch um, with, uh, with which tool. And we'd also pump a bit of clarity in there as well. Now, the only thing that I might consider is that this guy might have a bit more to give. I can see there's a little hint of some drama going in the background there. So if we make a new field adjustment layer, and if we just pull the maybe exposure down, so you can see there's something going on there. What about if we added more clarity? Yep, we've got a bit of interest going on. Um, probably that would help. Now obviously that's ruined the rest of the shot, so I've got two choices. I could rub out all the stuff under the sky, or uh, we could clear this mask, we could grab ourselves a brush, we could go onto our shot, we could make sure our flow is nice and low because that will slow down the build up of the underlying slider adjustments we've got here, and then we could just brush a little bit back into the sky so we've got that moodiness going on, if you like. So really that's the, the last thing that I might do with that particular shot. 
Um, Lewis, I just saw your question said, um, if I auto level, it seems to blow out the highlights when I activate the exposure warning. Now do check if you go into preferences under exposure, check what your uh, exposure warning is set to. So it's going to tell you when anything is above 250. So that's probably why. So if you really want to, to be sure, you can make that higher. But the, the benefit of having it slightly lower is that you can see when it starts to go. So over here, we've got an exposure warning, but it's only just like in a couple of places on the red channel, like so. So if you were really conscious about it, you could probably try and pull that back. But I wouldn't get too... Um, too sold on trying to always get rid of these exposure warnings because if we look at what's going on here i imagine the sun is you know just setting peeking out of shot or whatever so if you look at the numbers we're just losing the red a tiny bit like so so looking at our exposure warning you can see where we're just out but remember our warning is set to warn us of anything above 250. So if we put this to 255, you see it gets much smaller. So I'm willing to bet, Lewis, that if you're on the default, you're seeing a warning of anything above 250. Uh, but I wouldn't get too paranoid about making that go away because if you try to compress the image that much, so we could do it, then you just end up with something that often looks a little bit too much on the flat side. So please don't get too worried about making those warnings disappear okay but that's probably what it is uh, Gilbert said why did I not use auto mask when using a brush um, because for this area what would I auto mask to this cloud line then it would look really really super fake I would say so what we're looking to do is just try to be as subtle as possible so I might just fill in those areas a bit but in this case there's really no need to try and auto mask around something. Often the more accurate a mask, the more unpleasant it looks. So in this case, in many cases, it's very rare that you actually need to take a tight line around something. In an image coming up, we are gonna do that, but. Um, okay, next shot, I believe. So really the purpose of that is, don't worry if the white balance is off, exposure is not right horizon's not level that's really a simple edit for a, a powerful raw converter what should we go for next let's just quickly look at this one because this is a shot that you might readily pass by if you took that and you were looking on your memory card and you thought you know what i've fluffed that up it's a pity i didn't have my magic step ladder with me to change my angle of view because really the shot that i wanted was that because it's got a cool reflection in the glass there's loads of nice details or architectural details so that was kind of the shot i was looking for you may or may not know that you can uh, correct perspective in capture one but you can also correct horizontal and vertical perspective um, at the same time. So if we look at our cursor key up here, our keystone tool, we've got vertical, horizontal, or both. So if we choose this, we get four lines pop up on screen. And basically we need to tell Capture One what the error is on the shot. So if I zoom in a little bit and just scroll around, so I'm just gonna pop this on the outside of these panels. Um, we wanna to go to the top of the square of the window. So let's go to that one and then roughly pop it to, to this one here. Now try to be as accurate as possible because if you're a few millimeters out or whatever, then the resulting correction won't be as good. Now, if you're struggling to see then don't be afraid to you know, bump up the exposure or whatever. Let's just gray balance off one of those panels. Whoops, lost my thingies. Uh, and all we need to do is say apply in the center and Capture One will do a pretty good job of adjusting the keystone like so. Now you can see how the photo has been warped. 
uh, around in the background. So what I need to do is just fix my crop. Capture One won't let you crop outside of this non-existent image by default. If you do want to, if you think, you know what, I could just content aware fill in a little corner in Photoshop or Affinity Photo, you can right click and say crop outside image and then we can go beyond the bounds of the image like so. Like that corner would be super easy to fill in if you wanted to. Uh, but let's just keep it normal for this shot. So I'm going to go down to the bottom, stretch this out here and crop in a little bit tighter and so on. Now that was a pretty dramatic pull of the uh, pixels, if you like. So the danger or the, the fear is, um, well, won't this mess up the image quality? That was a bit aggressive. Hang on, let's just chuck in a bit of clarity as well. So if we look onto this shot, let's pump in a bit of structure, which will increase uh, the fine detail. As I said, that was a pretty dramatic yank around of the pex pixels. If we just make another variant. So this is the one we just did, and this is the pulled around one. Let's just bump up the exposure so we can see what's going on and just make it at least a similar color. So if we put these two next to each other and look at something with a bunch of detail. So that's the original, that's the one which has been messed with pixel wise. I mean, the quality is pretty good. Look, we can still see there's some subtle scratches or marks, you know, going on on the paneling there. Uh, if we make that 200%, very little degradation in quality, to be honest. And now we've ended up with a photo that, you know, we're pretty happy with. Um, I didn't require the magic step ladder to get the angle I wanted. Uh, but with a little thought of post-production as you take the shot, it's pretty impressive to, to come up with, you know, a final result like this. Let's pull the highlights down a bit, brighten a bit more, maybe even more clarity. And we've got a super nice shot. So that was just a really fast edit. Uh, this is um, the photographer who shot it, who's Innes, who works for us in R&D at Capture One, one of the developers. Uh, so that's her interpretation. And then that's just a quick edit like so coming from the original. So don't be afraid to stretch those pixels around. If you're thinking, ah, oh, but this is probably a 150 megapixel phase one camera, you cheats. But it is in actual fact a Fuji SX10, which is, correct me if I'm wrong, about 22 megapixels. So we've managed to drag those megapixels around and still get a pretty nice result. Okay, um, Paolo said, I miss the ability to adjust vertical and horizontal perspective independently, but at the same time. So don't forget all the uh, these sliders are doing, sorry, these alignment sliders are doing. All they're doing is actually calculating some values in the Keystone tool here. So by drawing that box, Capture One calculated, we needed 73.8 and 13.2. So you can just manually drag these sliders if you wish, if you don't have that point of reference. Might take you a little bit longer. In fact, I might just tweak it a little bit anyway. So you can see the little dancey dance it's doing. So I would just tweak it a little bit like so. Um, aspect will actually allow you to squash it like so or rise it. So sometimes with a heavy correction, the aspect doesn't look quite right. So that's a really handy slider that you can use to, you know, tweak it a little bit as well. And again, don't be afraid to mash those pixels around. The interpolation is actually pretty impressive. Uh, let's have a little look. Okay, let's check the questions. Um, you have two monitors. What do you put on the external monitor? Um, secret stuff. <laughs> um, generally, uh, for Capture One, I, I don't split it up between two monitors. Uh, the monitor in front of me, which you can't see, uh, is 27 inches. I find that enough real estate. But in terms of, you know, work work, uh, it's nice to have some items on one monitor and some items on another. Plus, this monitor is uh, an ISO, which is fantastic. It self calibrates every day. 
So that's a huge benefit for uh, photo editing. The only disadvantage is, of course, you take up um, desk space. Uh, but it, yeah, it's very useful to have two monitors. Let's see, and the last question I saw was, um, that's pretty good. David says, for those using two monitors, how are they used? <laughs> I used to have three monitors, but it was just getting a bit ridiculous for de desk space. Anyway, and, and actually knowing where to look was also a little bit overwhelming. So laptop, actually the laptop is on a raised stand, so that eye level, you know, everything is at the same. And they're really inexpensive. You can buy those all over the place, but just to bring the laptop up to a similar eye line to a normal monitor is actually a, a, a massive help. It's just like a little mini scissor lift. It's great. Right, let's edit something else. How are we doing for time? We've got just over 15 minutes. I have to remember to leave a bit of time for the couple of export samples. So let's take in, um, We've actually been a bit more efficient this afternoon compared to this morning. Let's reset this. The reason why I chose this one is because, first of all, I hope Maria, my colleague who shot this, didn't burn out her eyeballs because she's shooting directly into the sun. So be careful if you're doing that. Uh, and also make sure it doesn't burn your camera either. But anyway, this is a really super cool summer shot. Uh, obviously, we've got a stack of lens flare going on because we got the sun blasting straight into it. With these situations where you've got, you know, a big specular highlight, Lewis, you're definitely gonna get some exposure warning stuff going on now. You've got the choice as whether to, um, do I try and correct for this or do we just embrace it or maybe add to it? So you're gonna see if we pull the highlight slider down and the exposure all the way down, you know, brightness all the way down. Really, we've kind of hit the limit of this poor camera's sensor, and there's not really anything we can probably do to recover this in a nice way. So I personally, knowing that we are shooting into the sun, I don't think it's obnoxious to have this bright white space behind it. I might tone it down a teeny bit, but otherwise, personally, it doesn't bother me. Now, more pressing issues is that if we look into the right hand side over here it's quite uh, hazy or flary and we're losing a bit of color saturation and so on so what we can do with this is actually use the dehaze slider now the dehaze slider might not have the best effect on the entire picture but the good news is is that we can use it um, on a layer so first of all let's see what happens if we just bring up the dehaze slider like so it's actually having a nice positive effect down here, but it might be just causing a bit. Well, it's actually, let's see. It does actually bring some of that detail back. So I'm slightly in two minds. What I will say is if, if you're not happy with what the dehaze slider is doing over the whole shot, then don't forget we can pop that on a layer. So what I would do is make a new field adjustment layer. So right here under the plus button. So that's going to fill the entire shot with our mask. And now we can dehaze as we did before. Going to open up the shadows a bit, especially down here, like so, and maybe add a bit of clarity. So we've done a few different things on that, that layer. Now the addition of clarity and lifting the shadows if we don't like what's going on here, the easiest thing to do is grab our eraser, nice big brush, like so, and then we can just erase out what the dehaze slider did in the sky, if you wanna keep that bright sunshine behind it. I'm really in two minds whether it looked you know, better before or after, but now if we look at what's going on here, we've got significantly best, better contrast going on in the main area, like so. Um, I might even just open up the brightness a touch just to get a bit more light in there as well. Now, color wise, again, because it was shot you know, directly into the sun, uh, we've probably lost a little bit of the color saturation. So if we go to our advanced color editor and pick our sunflower petal here, like so, we can add in a little bit more saturation. We could brighten it if we wish, furthermore like so. 
So now I'm actually pretty happy with that. The only thing I might do is just darken this guy off a bit. So if we find our style brushes, if you haven't had a play with style brushes, it's just a super easy way if you're new to Capture One to get you know, a, a fast introduction into editing with layers, which is what we've been messing around a little bit here. So this is dehaze in the foreground, plus a bunch of other stuff. Now I want to darken this one a little bit, so I'm going to burn. So just by checking on this style brush, going over to the shot, and then I can just start masking like so. So that's just kicked a bit of density back into that spot. Simple. So it didn't require you to make a layer, didn't require an advanced knowledge of how to set up the brush. It's all kind of done for you. So if you're a little bit scared of layers, that's a speedy way to, to start editing. So if we look at our before, like so, and after. So even though Maria bravely risked her eyesight, I hope she wasn't looking through the viewfinder and shot directly into the sun, you can still get a really nice shot out of it. Um, probably on an older camera, it might have uh, not been so good. I mean, it's completely blown out there. I don't imagine we could re recover any of that, but we still got a nice summery sunflower picture at the end of it. So don't be afraid to, to see what you can recover. Uh, Dan said, "Does is the dehaze slider causing banding in the sky? Yeah, that, that was my fear really, that it might cause a little bit of, of banding. You can see it's almost creeping in now just with how it is out of the camera because of, you know, just having that blast of, of uh, daylight from the sun into it. So I was just a bit worried the dehaze slider might make that even worse, but you know, if you were watching this sunflower field and sat in this position, you kind of expect almost to have that brightness behind it. So I don't personally find it obnoxious. Okay, any questions coming up? Um, I think we're pretty good. Uh, which color profile do you use for editing? Are you setting with the proof, proof profile always set or based on the selected output? You know what, I forgot to check actually. Proof profile is on Adobe RGB at the moment, which for me is a pretty safe bet because if I'm um, exporting, it's either gonna be Adobe or RGB or sRGB, so there's not a massive amount between those two for this particular shot. If I knew this was, was going to print and there was a specific print profile, then I might dig in a bit further, but for general editing, Adobe is fine. Uh, Ty says, could you reduce dehaze to create haze in the sky? Yeah, probably. Let's just make a new field adjustment layer and pull the dehaze downwards. Oh no, it didn't work. Actually made the banding worse, as you can see. But nice thought though. Top marks for effort there, Ty. That was uh, Ty on Facebook. So <laughs> thanks for that suggestion. But in this case, it didn't work. But in other shots, actually using the dehaze slider to introduce a bit of haze has worked really, really nicely. So hold that thought. Okay, I think um, we're gonna very quickly edit this one and then we talk about export. So I'll do this one quite fast. Now this is a super cool shot that was shot by a ex-colleague of mine, Anna. So thanks Anna for letting me use this one. But we have an Onyx, I believe, uh, Namibian animal experts shout up if that's not right, but I think it's an onyx. Um, but what do we know about this shot? Well, we can see the sand is probably not the right color. It's it's pretty flary, I reckon, just because of the position of the sun, there might be a bit of lens flare going on. It's super sharp, so focus is spot on. For me, it might actually a bit be a bit too over sharp, so I'm gonna back that off a little bit in the sharpening. Otherwise, there was just almost a bit of halo coming on as well. So I think it needs to have that taken off or reduced slightly. Now, white balance, the camera is well and truly overcompensated with uh, the, the warmth of the shot. The sand isn't a great color. So I would definitely pull this up and instantly everything starts coming together a little bit more. Before we do anything else, let's just crop that. Oh, just make sure there wasn't any other adjustments on. No, it was just cropped, I think. That's good. 
contrast wise, you can see, look on our levels, we've got no information here, we've got no information here, which is also meaning why it's looking a little bit flat and hazy. So before jumping straight to the dehaze slider, we can actually see if setting our levels helps, and it does actually a fair bit. So I might back this off a tiny bit. It's a fine line between it getting too warm and looking a bit mucky to looking not like the desert at all. So looking at the before and after, you know, we've come a long way with just a, a few simple corrections. Now the sky is maybe less interesting now because we might like it to be a richer blue. So a couple of choices. Now the gentleman who was asking about uh, auto masking earlier, you could argue that would you could auto mask around the sky, but that's going to be slow and a little bit boring. So we've got two choices. We could use the color editor. Let's try that. So if I click on the sky, notice where it's selected. You can, can't quite see it, but that dot in the center of the triangle, that's our selected color. Now that's a real delicate pastel -y color. So pulling around the lightness slider or bumping up the saturation, there's a limit to where I can get. Now that's not bad, but it's, I'm maxed out the sliders here. So what if I wanted to do a little bit more than that? So now it would make more sense to actually select or mask this area and use some other tools to improve on it. So auto masking to the gentleman who asked is an option, but it's gonna be your slowest option. So we're gonna make a new layer and we're gonna grab our magic brush. We're gonna make sure the mask is turned on so we can see where we're brushing. Let's make this a bit bigger. Tolerance wise, this, uh, as it says there, adjusts the range of um, colors that will be selected based on my selection, which you'll see in a second. So I'm gonna draw on the picture and then based on the tolerance, capture one will capture uh, similar colors to that based on the tolerance. So a high tolerance, it will throw out the net wider. A low tolerance, it's gonna be more, um, more choosy. Uh, refine edge, that's gonna handle when our sample zone hits an edge that doesn't match with our selected sample. And how hard edge do we want it to be? I want it to have a little bit of finesse, so I'm gonna bump that up. So all I need to do now is just do a little squiggle and then our sky is almost perfectly selected. So I just need to add a bit there. Hey presto, sky selected. Now to auto mask that would have been a right laborious pain. So now what we can do is we can use some other tools. So let's bring the exposure down. We could add a bit of saturation like so. And then if we wanted to, we could also click in our advanced color editor and then we could play with the saturation here. We could change the hue. We could make it a lot more teal like if you want, or we could really push it towards the other direction as well. So personal preference, how you might want to make that look. I think the last thing I would do is if we look at our style brushes and take burn, is I just want to darken this area off a little bit more. So I'm just going to brush in here, being careful not to darken our star oryx, not onyx, um, or gems box, thanks Alex. Because we don't want to darken him or her, we want her to stand out from the background like so. So let's turn on before and after, really kind of wishy-washy flat, not the right colors. We really didn't have to do a lot just to get it a lot more punchy. Again, I'm guessing time of day was probably not the best for this. So, and plus the sun is super bright. There's no shade or anything. What were we, we were at 8.30 in the morning, so, and it was up early to, to shoot this. But again, plenty of data in the raw file to make the best of it. Milko said, I would have expected a luminance mask. We could have done, but that would have taken us longer because we would have had to make a new field mask. Then we would have had to adjust our uh, luminance range to capture that bit. Let's actually try it. So if we do a new field adjustment layer, let's turn on the grayscale mask so we can see what we're doing. So, so we're two clicks in already. Click number three, turn on our luma range, and it's probably somewhere around the mid-tone, so let's cut that out. Almost, almost. 
but look, I can't get the perfect selection because if I want all of the sky, I've got some of the mountainside and some of the brightness of the sun reflecting off the rocks. So it's kind of hard to actually even do it with the Luma range. So I've already spent 30 seconds mucking about, whereas before it was just, you know, a couple of clicks and we were done. So doesn't mean the Luma range tool isn't great. It is, it's great for something a bit more complex, but when we've got this lovely defined edge, Magic Brush works cool. Okay, just to finish off, saw a question, what is auto mask? Because I totally thought Magic Brush is an auto mask. It is an away, uh, Fran, I was gonna say Fran, Fawn. It is an away Fawn, but the auto mask works on a different principle. So if you right click while you've got the brush set up, you can see auto mask, you get a third circle in the middle and you're basically sampling uh, an edge. So it's like a, it's like a crappy magic brush, I suppose. Um, it has its place in editing workflow, but I think generally the magic brush will replace that a lot of the time. I'm sure there's some uses for it, but I would now much favor using the magic brush, the color editor to create a mask, just using the color editor only, you know, brushing a mask in, generally is faster and gives you a nicer result than the auto mask itself. Okay, very quickly for exporting, I just wanna show you something I do a fair amount. So we're happy with this shot. Uh, I might like to upload this to Instagram perhaps, um, but another thing I like to do when I'm traveling, and there's loads of services that do this, and it's a uh, huge fun, is to send uh, postcards, but based on your own photography. How awesome is it to send a postcard from Namibia to your friends and family with a shot that you took that arrives in 24 hours? Uh, I don't know what the post is like in Namib Namibia, but I'm guessing it's not as speedy as you know, 24 to 48 hours. So what I do for this is that this is my final shot. I'm gonna make a um, clone the variant and I change the color tag to purple. So I know this is gonna be a postcard. Now the postcard service I use is called uh, TouchNote, but there's loads out there. So I set up a specific recipe for postcards. Why? because it allows me to crop and sharpen specifically to the right dimensions. Because I don't wanna upload this to touch note because then it's gonna crop off the sides. I don't have the choice of how it's gonna be cropped. It's kind of slap bang in the middle. So if we go into our export dialogue, I'm gonna make a new process recipe and we're gonna call that uh, touch note P card, like so. Uh, we are going to save this to, uh, let's just make sure that, yeah, this is trying to save to my other user account. So let's just set that to the pictures folder. So we've got the touch note postcard. Um, I'm going to make sure that I add TN on the, on the naming. So I know it's for touch note. Uh, I want a JPEG. No point doing a hundred percent quality because they're pretty small. And I know the dimensions specifically for touch note is something very odd, which is 1,819 pixels by, I've got this on a piece of paper, I'm not clever enough to remember it, by 1,382. So that is the dimensions of a touch note postcard. So that's great. Um, I'm respecting the crop. I'm gonna add some output sharpening for print, but just a little bit, cause it's not like super high quality um, output or anything. So that's my uh, touch note postcard, like so. Um, I'm also want to have it for Instagram, so we might as well export this one now. Um, I've just put Insta on the image name, like so. And this is exporting to a width of 1080 pixels and it has a little bit of sharpening for screen. So quite a different process recipe. Let's, uh, let's just pop that into a subfolder called exports for this one. And we're gonna export one image like so. Now we do something with the cropping in a second. So there is Namibia for Insta. You can see Insta on the name. 
Now for the touch note one, if you remember on the export recipe, we've got these weird dimensions, 1819 by 1382 pixels. No idea what aspect ratio that is. Don't really need to know either. So with this recipe selected, you can just hit escape to exit this dialog, by the way. I'm going to go to my crop tool and I'm going to change the ratio to my output. And what that means is the currently selected recipe in the output dialog. So as soon as I touch this um, corner, watch what happens. You can see we've already got 18, 19 pixels at the top. And in red, we've got 1059 pixels because it doesn't match my output recipe. But as soon as I touch this, notice how it jumps like so. So now I can crop absolutely perfectly to this slightly strange format like so. So now that's absolutely bang on for the aspect ratio of touch note. So now I'm happy to export that out like so. And then if we look in here uh, once, oh, I forgot to set the export folder. Let's just pop it in there. We've now got the touch note postcard like so. So that's just a little really handy tip for output dimensions. If you need to set to particular output dimensions, that is the way to do it. Otherwise, you just have to fuss around for ages for the uh, crop tool. Okay. There we go. I think we are pretty much uh, bang on time uh, for ending, pretty much. Let's just uh, check for the last few questions. Uh, Philip was asking, how would you separate the animal from the background? Well, without it looking a little bit fake, what we could do is I would just bring in some dodge, if you like, zoom in a bit. Let's make this brush smaller. I would perhaps just lighten him or her ever so slightly without creating too much of a halo. Because if we have a big halo around it, it's gonna look really odd, but just brightening slightly just might make it a little bit more visible. So if we turn dodge on and off, then we separate it out like so. I mean, you could brighten this whole area a little bit behind it or darken it, but I would just be a little bit careful and mindful. But I think it's pretty visible. It's, I mean, we're looking on a fairly small output here, but if you imagine you printed that fairly big, I think it would stand out nicely because we've got that big sun line down to the left hand side of it. Let's see, uh, Fawn says, walked away for a bit, so I have to rewatch. Uh, use variants for different cropped outputs. Yes, that's essentially what we did uh, because you don't want to have to recrop this one for a particular format and then crop again. I just prefer to set them up nicely like this and then actually at the end of a trip, because I'm a bit of a postcard nutter, then I can just filter by purple and actually see all the postcards that have winged their way around the world. So I just find that easier. You could, of course, recrop each one if you wanted to. Uh, last question. I think Diego's been typing away like a crazy man in the background. <laughs> so we're pretty much covered. Uh, if you want to review the webinar, Sophia, it will be on YouTube a bit later. It was supposed to go to YouTube at the same time and just be ready as a recording. Unfortunately, the service we use to stream to different locations is experiencing some technical issues. So it hasn't gone out to YouTube, but I will put it there this evening so you can find it a bit later on. Thanks for joining me today. I hope you found that useful, a little bit different that it was editing and some workflow things but i think all of those aspects are important when you are you know dealing with pictures that weren't necessarily shot under the right lighting conditions position time of day all that stuff but you can still pull it all together in the raw converter if you want to see animals then come back tuesday at the same time that we started just on youtube hopefully if the service is up and running and uh, we can then go through some wildlife edits as well take care of everyone and see you soon bye now